This is what I'm putting the mic on. I love Baldur's Gate 3, if that wasn't already obvious. This game has an incredible story and beautifully written characters. The dialogue in this game is so far beyond any other video game. I have to stress this because I'm gonna get critical. There's one teeny tiny little aspect about this story that I'm not the biggest fan of. And this is coming from a big nerd, so this entire video is basically me just going, um, actually, to the game's writers. Which means, take this with a grain of salt, it's not a big deal, I'm not that upset, it's just a rant, I love the game, but I have to yell about it. Because, it's about Carlock. Or, Gortash. Or, well, um, uh, wait, uh, yeah. Okay, okay, it's, it's about Zeriel. Uh, I know, I know, we know that I'm the Zeriel enjoyer. Does that make me biased? Kinda. Is it going to affect my argument? I really hope not. I am not here to defend my personal interpretation of a D&D character or, you know, these two characters from a video game. I want to analyze a section of this game, talk about why it's weird, explain what I would have done differently, all in a hyperbolic tone. Because I'm not a big brain, smart video essay YouTuber with the greatest critical media analysis this side of the Chianthar. I make funny ha-has and uh, like games a lot. And this is my opinion. This is my opinion. This, this, this is my opinion. Do you know what else is my opinion? That Factor is just so cool. Our video sponsor. When things get hectic and you don't wanna order out all the time, Factor is my personal go-to. I've genuinely incorporated Factor into my entire life. I love it. It's quick, it's easy, and it tastes delicious. And they have so many options that you can choose from. Like this chicken penny with Parmesan broccolini or these red velvet pancakes. Oh, I love their breakfasts. They also sent me these really great wellness shots. And I love their protein shakes too. This cinnamon horchata and the cold brew ones are oh they're so good i drink these like every day i love being able to get my factor box and being able to customize all of it to have all my meals prepped for the rest of the week it makes things easy and delicious and much cheaper on my end of things so head to factor75.com or click the link down below and use the code fireball50 to get 50 percent off your first factor box that's factor75.com or click the link below and use the code fireball50 to get 50 percent off that first box i'm so surprised at how good this is okay so from the beginning the year ten air the place sleepy little town called baldur's gate our hero karlak a knock-kneed delinquent from the outer city with everything to give and nothing to lose i love karlak so much look all the characters in this game are obviously really great but she is i think we can all agree she is just the absolute best honey i could go all night her story is so captivating too. It's about freedom, reclamation, and sacrifice, and having ADHD. Depends on the type. Ice devils hate an inferno, but that's an easy one. Orthons love projectiles. What they don't love is getting their bombs lobbed right back in their faces. Sharp instincts, sharp weapons, and a knack for improvisation. That's the only way to survive them. <laughs> anyway, what were we talking about? She's just like me for real. For most players, you'll find Carlock in Baldur's Gate 3 right after meeting up with Will, and he's like, I gotta, I gotta kill her. Advocatus Diaboli. You find out later that Will has been tricked by his patron, Mizora. I am so down bad. Make a pact with her? He's just like me for real. Into hunting down Carlock because he was told that she's a devil who's gonna burn down the Sword Coast. There's a lot of Sword Coast... I I don't even really think like a pit fiend could, it, it, this does not matter at all. And for most players, Will realizes that she's just a tiefling who escaped the clutches of Zeriel from Avernus. She's finally free. She's got an infernal machine in her chest, but she's not in her prison and she just wants to live. Wipe those paladins of tears, save her from Azora, give her a hug, bonk Gortash on his stupid little head. I love our fiery little friend. Seriously, the story that they crafted for Carlock is one of the best that I've ever experienced in a video game. Next to Astarian. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Astarian. Everybody's been mad about that on Twitter. I know his name means little star. I, I get it, I get it, I'm sorry. I'm just so American and everybody's British and they're always like Astarian. And I just, I was like, stay, Astairs, Astarian. Her story is so gut-wrenching, emotional. And I, there were a few times where I had to stop playing the game because I was <laughs> really sad. And you, you'll just keep going, won't you? Watching the stars. Warming your hands on the campfire, dancing, eating, making fucking love all night. All of it, all of it! That's my reward!
reward for everything I suffered. That's why I survived ten years of torment. The fighting, the clawing, the loneliness. <laughs> Loneliness. Carlock is a beautifully written character. I'm, I loved experiencing it, and I, I was very emotional about it. So it's just beautiful. Okay, except they serve the arch devil Zaria, biggest liar in all the realms. Seems her servants have picked up some of Mummy's tricks. <sighs> I don't know why Zeriel is so mischaracterized in this game. More specifically, by Carlock and by the event that happened in her backstory that it got her sold to her. Actually, any other time that she's referenced in the story and anybody talks about her, it's like super accurate to me. They really did their homework with this. Such a witless little thing. Laugh in the face of the Archduchess Zariel. And she only laughs back. Go on if you want, but I can't. That's right, Carlock. So now, as in the hells, I could see why her ladyship wants a murderous brute like you back. I'd be hunting devils and demons, she said. Traitors and hypocrites, heartless evils of all sorts, but not... Not Zariel's victims. Not innocent tieflings. This is just so perfect because not only is Carlock an innocent tiefling who has been her victim, but also so are the tiefling refugees from El Terrell. She pulled El Terrell down into the nine hells and caused these people to lose their home and they were innocent. It, ah, oh, it's so good. Funnily enough, it's more Carlock's perspective. Now, I'm not trying to say that I'm a Zariel apologist and Carlock's just got it all wrong. Because Carlock's entire story is about how she was sold, abused, used like a tool, and then escapes her captor. And her entire perspective on this situation and who this person is should be... Fuck them. Fuck Zariel. She's never going back. She's free. This devil is my abuser and the worst thing ever. Valid but not my argument. I'm not gonna dive into the full annotated history of the Archduke of Avernus. You can read about that on the wiki if you want to, but I will give you the simple version. Zeriel is a celestial, an angel who has witnessed the Blood War for a long time. The Blood War is a big war that takes place on the first layer of the Nine Hells, Avernus, where devils fight back hordes and hordes of endless demons. One day, Yanogu and a bunch of gnolls attack a village and Zeriel has had enough. She intervenes and then she, vows to kill them all every last one, <laughs> goes to the holy city of El Terrell and conscripts a bunch of their soldiers to dive into the Nine Hells and fight the Blood War head on. They charge in, Zeriel fights tooth and nail, and a bunch of the now called Hell Riders uh, abandon her because Oh my god, uh, we're not winning this! <laughs> Zeriel is betrayed, infected by a lot of demon ichor, and nearly dies. Ozaluth finds Zeriel buried underneath countless bodies and bring her back to Asmodeus, who goes, that was sick, dude, do you want to rule Avernus? <laughs> and thus she becomes the Archduke of Avernus, kicks Bell out of his seat, and rages against the demons. But wh why would she side with the devils? I read their stat block and it says evil right there. Cause the blood war pretty much keeps endless demons from invading all of the planes. Asmodeus and a lot of the original arch devils were once celestial angels and they took up the mantle to fight against this horde. But their blood, the demon ichor, tainted them and they became devils. This is at least the story that I understand. Utilizing pact and contract magic to bind mortals to their plane to add to their army and infernal hierarchy. Okay, all of that just to say that in my opinion, deep down, z stop looking at that alignment. We know how to tell complicated stories now, we're adults. Deep down, Zeriel cares and wants to protect the material plane and the people on it. It's why she descended in the first place. To be fair, I think most devils kind of feel this way, but we'll get to that. Now, I'm not trying to say that everybody actually misunderstands the devils and they're really good actually. It's more complicated than that and I'll get into it. Zeriel descended in the first place because there was an injustice. Innocents were slaughtered and she couldn't stand by. Zeriel descended because she realized that the high and mighty celestials that were among her rarely contribute to the real fight in Avernus. Zeriel descended because she thought it was the right thing to do. Do her loyalties now lie with the Nine Hells? Yes, but the weight of its importance isn't because she likes war a lot, it's because the demons are a threat. She's seen it. So all of that to say, I think that Gortash selling Carlock to Zeriel is the weirdest thing to me. 
It seems so out of character to me that Zeriel would just conscript random people into her army that she has no connection to or hasn't made a contract with or anything. I totally get that she wants to win the blood war, but it kind of goes against everything she stands for if she just starts accepting offers from random people. Yes, I get that she can be evil. Yes, I know that she's a devil and maybe she doesn't really have her original motivations within her anymore and she's just big, bad, and evil. This is reducing her character down to nothing so you can make her whatever you want to be. Which like, yeah, fine, if you do that in your D&D games, cool, great for you, but I played this video game and I like this character and I went, I don't like this, now I'm making a YouTube video about it. Getting back into it, now, to be fair, I know that Gortash has a connection to the Hells and to Raphael, so he's not just some random person who hit up Zeriel on the Sending Stone. But devil to devil, I don't really think Raphael cares too much about the Blood War that with his floating mansion above the entire thing, where he can safely keep his distance. Ah, oh, so cool. And same goes the other way. I don't really think Zeriel uh, has a big connection to that guy. They're not like hanging out. They're not buddies. So to Zeriel, this is a random guy. Even if he was like, no, no, I'm good friends with Raphael. He's not good friends with Raphael. But even if he was like, I, I'm good friends with Raphael, she'd be like, I don't care. <laughs> I can totally see how this could be a interpretation of Zeriel's character where she's become desperate and blindly believes that fighting the blood war is all that she's good for. But I think that again, this interpretation leaves her very diluted and reduces her down to just being a big evil lady. And, Maybe that's okay. Maybe that's all that's needed for this game. She doesn't need to be any more than that. She doesn't need to bloat the story any more than it already is. And I totally understand that. But if I could have done it! In my understanding of this character, she doesn't conscript every living soul into her cause. Would she? Yes, if they came offering. I have no doubt that Zeriel would be like, yes, please fight in my war. I, I This is what I want. It's, you know, I sort of care about the material plane, but I care more about winning this war. But the issue here is that contacting a devil, even for a contract, is not an easy thing to do. I know that they make it seem like that in Baldur's Gate 3 with Raphael showing up, you know, the second you start walking around. He's like, hello, I'm here to offer you a solution. There's also a lot of rules about it in D&D, but I am not going to focus on that because this isn't about, oh, this doesn't make sense in the rules. It's, it, it's about the story, and I want to find out the why for the sense of the story. So, from what I know, with my knowledge and everything on this wiki, <laughs> Gortash is buddies with Karlock. One day, Gortash sells Karlock off to Zeriel. Zeriel puts an infernal war machine in there and Gortash goes, oh, nice idea. Gortash then makes his steel machine things and then uh, the rest of the plot happens. So Gortash was similarly sold to a warlock of Raphael when he was a kid. So what we're seeing here is a uh, victim repeating the abuse that they've received because he's a villain. Side note, I'm, becoming conscious and outside of the script for a moment to say that I think that this also applies to Zeriel in a way, but the way that she's interpreted in the game is not the way to do it in my opinion, but continuing, Gortash was imprisoned in the House of Hope and lived with Raphael for a long time, which the wiki says like he saw as his father, but I'm not really sure where that quote is in the game because I haven't really done too much with Gortash, so I could just totally be wrong about this, and if so, light me up in the comments. <laughs> but with that, we can reasonably assume that Gortash knows how to contact Archdevils and sell their so wait, sell? What did he receive? What did he get in return? The Infernal War Machine? That does not make sense because I feel like Zeriel just did that. I don't think Gortash, <laughs> Gortash was like, hey, Zeriel, can you take this and put an Infernal War Machine in it? I. I just know how passionate you are about those. Why did Gortash do this? There is no explanation. I looked it up and uh, Reddit thinks it maybe got cut. I, I don't know. Apparently there was supposed to be an entire section of the upper city in the final game that didn't happen. I, I don't know, it might just be rumors, I'm not sure. My personal theory is that it has to do with the Steel Watchers and their mechanism, and it's similar to the mechanism that Karlak has. But regardless, bro hit up Zeriel for no reason and was just like, here, and she would, yeah, thanks. <laughs> what? What, when Gortash was escaping the House of Hope on Raphael's desk, he he snatched a spell scroll of summon Archdevil to clean up all my loose ends? <laughs> this is not what Zeriel does. You can't just, oh, uh, You can't just send someone off to be conscripted by a devil. And if you can in the D&D world, then, whoa, that's insane. Everybody should be doing that to everybody they hate all the time. Just pray to a devil real hard and they'll show up and take your friends away to fight the blood war. <laughs> God.
god! Carlock talks about how she wasn't the best fighter in uh, Zariel's army. In the grand scheme of things, I'm inconsequential to Zariel. Sure, I've got the engine, but I wasn't even her strongest fighter. Yeah, because her entire army is devils! Big giant dudes! This is Lucille. This is like her second in command. She, yeah, she wasn't living up to a pit fiend with cool armor. She, what? Yeah, I know that all the characters are basically like level 10 or 15 before they got the tadpole inserted into their brain and Carlac could have very easily been uh, a barbarian who was really strong in the nine hells. But I mean, come on, she says it herself. Maybe that's why she has the infernal machine in her. It beefed her up to keep up with the rest of her army. Why would Zariel want a random tiefling who she has to beef up with her own mechanisms to even fight? Karlak was Gortash's personal bodyguard. That is not on the same level as this. Let's put this into perspective. This is the equivalent to like working your way up the corporate ladder to become like a manager at a Target. And maybe on the weekends you do Taekwondo. Then one day the regional manager shows up with the president himself and is like, you're gonna go serve in the military now, bye. And then Joe Biden himself shows up and escorts you personally to his secret lab where you'd go into the matrix and have to learn Kung Fu because you work a nine to five. Devils have a hierarchy system within the nine hells. When you pop up, you become a lemur in the maggot pits. And then depending on the amount of kills you get and mortals that you can script, you can basically rank up and become other forms of devils. So let's look at someone like Mizora. We don't really know much about Mizora, but assuming she's like every other devil, she started here, then had to claw her way up the chain to get into the position that she sits in now, which likely took her hundreds of years. Now let's take Mizora and, you know, let's look at all of Zariel's army, the other beings that are there. Then this tiefling shows up and Zariel's just like, you're my special soldier. No wonder Mazora hates her so much. <laughs> now, yeah, this all makes sense. Karlak talked about how Zeriel treated her like a pet, that Zeriel doesn't like her lost assets. She fought in the blood war, surrounded by more powerful beings than her. It all checks out. Look, she even lost her horn. Like, she's obviously been through a lot. That all makes sense to me. The part that doesn't is why Zeriel did it in the first place. Joe Biden has people for this. There's a recruitment system for a reason. I hate this comparison so much. Why did Zariel go out of her way to get Carlock in her pitiful humanoid form, then beef her up with an infernal war machine, then get mad when she leaves and orders her death? I think that Zariel sees the devils as fodder. You fucked up on the material plane and now you fight. In the D&D adventure Descent into Avernus, she brings down all of Elturel, a whole city, because... Spoilers for this book. Craig, Mia, Spencer, Colton, get, Lee, get out of here. Don't watch this part, because she made a deal with the High Overseer to save his city. He was desperate, the city was attacked by vampires for no reason, and she intervened. It's very similar to her own story. Thing is, she had a special interest in El Terrell because, you know, the hell riders who betrayed her when she first descended. She's got this sick view on justice that turns into petty revenge when she wants the entire city to suffer her same fate because she knows she's a monster. She's like, um, I'm gonna help you now, but because of that thing you did that one time a long time ago where you all said, you all promised that you were going to help me fight back the entire horde of demons and devils, I'm going to bring you down here so that you act good on that. And Thavius Krieg wants to hold on to his power and doesn't want to tell anybody that he made a deal with an archdevil, so oh, oops, there it goes. I think Zeriel sees this really messed up system that Asmodeus has going on and is like, well, they made the contract, it's on them. There was a time where I was desperate too. Cause like she's an angel and has been having that kind of perspective her entire existence. And also she's just kind of a petty nerd about justice. Funnily enough, I think the way that Zeriel is characterized in Baldur's Gate 3 fits Bell way more. Bell is the previous ruler of Avernus and is the exact opposite of Zeriel. Cunning strategist utilizes his guile and assets to fight the blood war. He makes weighted deals with folks that he always comes out on top, keeps Asmodeus happy and sits pretty and screws over anybody who tries to get in his way. Zeriel is, <clears throat> Always where the fighting is thickest. Mike got undone. Bell, honestly, kind of sounds a lot like Raphael to me. Except Raphael doesn't care about the blood war. And to be fair, Bell doesn't really either, but he, he, he knows it's his duty. But even then, imagine Gortash throws Carlock to Raphael. 
Like, what does bro even do with her? At least with Gortash, it made sense. His parents sold him to a warlock so that they could pay off debts in Baldur's Gate, the city of trade. Like, there's a whole reason as to why that happens. It all makes sense. Going off with, you know, the characterization of devils, even Raphael has a semblance of wanting to help. Yes, it's flawed and wrong, and he's a nasty, nasty man, but there are endings to this game where you can side with him and get off scot-free. I think it's a super interesting detail about the devil's history that they used to be celestials and then eventually became corrupted. The personification of lawful evil, which is kind of what the original idea of them was. They have a hierarchy. They want to help make deals, but ultimately win in the end. And this is Zeriel's flaw. She can't win. She is so filled with rage that it blinds her. She thinks that by endlessly fighting that she can fix everything, but in reality, Avernus works. Asmodeus sits back and laughs because he's got a fiery new general who's going to make life a lot easier for all the other archdevils on their planes. They don't have to fight as much because Zeriel is in the thick of it. All in the supposed name of justice. Zeriel isn't helping anyone but herself. Okay, it's me a couple of hours later. Uh, I was recording this at like 4 and now it's 11.30 p.m. because I had a bunch of stuff to do today. And now I'm back to finish the rest of the video. <laughs> My hair's up now. I don't want to put it back down. This is, uh, deal with it. So, what I would have done. Backstory rewrite. I would have Gortash experimenting on infernal war machines that he picked up while he was in Avernus because he's a tinkerer slash artificer. I don't know. He went on day trips down to the blood war with Raphael. It's more feasible than some other liberties that have been taken here. He realized they don't work on the material plane when he gets there, but he has this idea for the perfect soldier. He meets Karlak. Everything's the same, but he betrays Karlak and his other soldiers by shoving these infernal war machines into them to try to make them work. All of them die except for Karlak. He gets the machine working, but with the side effect that she'll die if she stays in the material plane, much like the main game. But now she's like this super soldier and is really, really powerful. Gortash doesn't really care all that much about her. He, he needed them to get his theories to work, and now it does. He has the blueprint for the Steel Watcher. He can get his army, but he probably feels a little bit of remorse for Karlok. So, he tries to save her life by contacting Zeriel. And just like I said before, we'll assume that he knows how to do this from his time that he spent with Raphael in the Nine Hells. He could have witnessed other people who had contacted Raphael in the same way. Zeriel uh, couldn't be bothered, but when she sees how powerful of a being Karlak has become with an infernal engine, she's interested. I wouldn't say sold, just interested. Just like, okay, what? She could be empowered on Avernus, fight well in the Blood War, but she's just a person. She has no contract with Zeriel, she has no connection to the Nine Hells, and Gortash has nothing to offer. You'd save her life. Zeriel is then immediately reminded of herself. She too was saved by descending to the Nine Hells. Karlak serves no purpose on the material plane other than death, and in her eyes, she would serve a better one on Avernus. Swinging back almost to Zeriel's original angelic motivations, the one of salvation. So she agrees. She takes Karlak. And in my mind, it's almost a similar situation that happens at the end of the main campaign of Baldur's Gate 3, where she's basically about to die, but then decides as a last resort that she'll continue to live if she goes with Zeriel. Where the story, for the most part, plays out like normal. She hates Gortash, not because he sold her to Zeriel, but because he experimented on her and all of the other people that she was soldiers with. And also hates Zeriel because she's basically treated like a pet and has to fight in this. Like, who wants to do that? But eventually escapes and finds her freedom. When she escapes, Zeriel assumes she's betrayed her. Mazura also probably doesn't help by convincing Zeriel that she did so. Zeriel's grace is at her limit. She doesn't own Karlok, but she feels the same sort of anger she felt towards the Hellriders. Thus, Mazora sends Will, and the story plays out how it does in the game. And then the last thing I would change, which is arguably the whole reason I made this video, is just the language they use to describe Zeriel. You can forget about the whole story with Gortash and all of that stuff. It doesn't really serve that big of a purpose within the game. The game's still great. It still works. It's fine. But... Lil Zeriel Enjoyer Jacob was listening to the words that they used to describe her, and I was just like, ah. She's not a deceiver. She's not a cunning strategist. She's not chasing her assets. She's angry, petty, belligerent, and misguided. She's a fallen angel obsessed with justice. Evil finds its roots in passion, where it's 
innocent. Sacrifice is what makes you a hero. Carlock and Zeriel can relate to both of those things. Carlock is actually such a great antithesis to Zeriel. I just wish we could have seen it. Um, thank you so much. Oh, Jesus. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really care about this subject. I'm off script now, so there's going to be a lot more uhs and pauses. I just want to thank you for checking this out and watching this and giving an ear to my rants and ramblings about characters that I really like. But just to let you know, upcoming on January 27th, I'm actually going to be running the first game of my modified version of Descent into Avernus. I have wanted to live stream Descent into Avernus for so long. It is genuinely probably my favorite pre-written adventure that they've ever written. I've run it like once all the way through and then two other times that I didn't finish. As you know, I've made this video before. I'm, I'm not like a big fan of like the intro and I had a lot of inspiration from a lot of other media that I like. Yeah, yes, it's you. Yes, a lot of it's you. And have in my head for the past like two years had my own version of this game that I've wanted to run for so long with a whole beginning arc that like takes place in the wilderness very much inspired from like Baldur's Gate 3 but also completely changing the Baldur's Gate section to uh, really fit into the rest of the narrative which is why I don't really want to call it Descent into Avernus because I don't want people to jump in and it's like the third game and there's no Avernus in sight or Baldur's Gate because I want it to take place a little bit outside of Baldur's Gate first so I'm calling it Descend, and I'm running it with my friends over on Arcane Arcade. January 27th is the first game. I've literally been preparing this. Like the story's been in my head for like two years and I've, I've spent the past six months preparing this. This is the most amount of artists that we've ever hired onto a project. There's a song that me and Travis Savoy have been working on. Um, I'm going really hard with this, harder than I've ever gone with a campaign that I've ever run before on that channel. So. It would mean a lot to me if you tuned in, checked it out. What I keep telling my friends is that it this is wish fulfillment D&D. This is the D&D game I have always wanted to run ever since I started playing it. So yeah, thanks for watching this video. Thank you all of you for everything, all the views and everything that you guys did. Oh, and last thing, um I, I made a community post a little while ago to help out my friend who's uh, in the hospital currently. And um, you guys really pulled through on that. Like that was really huge. I got to talk to, um, his name is Zach. I got to talk to Zach on the phone um, uh, the day that they met the goal um, for that fundraiser. And that, it was a really emotional moment for both of us. Like we, we were like both crying. So um, it, it really, really means a lot to me that you would just help somebody that you don't even know. And you guys are the real heroes. Thank you so much uh, for everything. And uh, that's where I'm going to leave this video is on that note. So I love you guys so much. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to descend now. Here I go. I'm going to, I'm going to descend.